This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing tonight? I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini, along with Rob Barrett's King of All Engineers. How you doing? How you feeling? Everything okay? Good. Hope you are enjoying your weekend. This is the Author's Corner. First time authors, for the most part, who've gone through the very same process you're going through right now, trying to get it together, get the stories from your head to your computer to the publisher. So here we go again. Nicole Streit wrote, What If I Was, which sounds kind of like, what if I was fill in the blank? Like, what if I was an apple, I would be delicious to eat. So where did this come from? <laughs> I had a project in fourth grade to write a paper on what if I was something, but the teacher said write about something and didn't specify, you know, you could write about any, everything. <laughs> so I decided to use the, the alphabet and write what if I was something from each letter of the alphabet, and I ended up getting an F on the paper because I didn't listen to directions because I didn't just pick one specific thing to write about. So um, I decided, well, I thought that was a good idea, so I would make a book out of it many years later. We're going all the way back to fourth grade. Yes. I I take it this was an experience that stuck with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Give me a few examples. What if I were, what if you were an apple? Um, It was, what if I was an apple? I'd be delicious to eat. Um, Another one would be, if I was a plate, I'd be served with food on me. What if I was a yo-yo, I would do special tricks. What if I was a dragon, I would grab the biggest castle. And then just keeps on going all throughout the alphabet. It sounds like a great way to teach kids the alphabet. Yeah, um, I ended up changing it in the, um, I had made it through Create Space where you can make your own book, and that just didn't work. It just didn't look right and everything, so that's why I left the page. But I changed it um, after showing my son's preschool teacher. She said, oh, it'd be really cool if you put the alphabet on top and highlighted the word. I said, oh, that's a good idea. So I ended up doing that in the book, too. So the preschool teacher liked it? which means other preschool teachers might like it. My other son, he's in kindergarten. His teacher liked it also. Are you reading it to kids? Not as of yet. Any plans to expose your book to little ones and their parents to see how they like it? Yes, I would love to get into schools and libraries for the, you know, the mommy and me reading time. You said that you, you started this in Create a Space? Yeah, create. I think it's Create Space. And then you decided to go with Paige after that? Yeah, it was really hard to use, um, definitely not user-friendly, but it just turned out really junky. <laughs> so you were glad you went with Paige? That was a good experience? Yes. Well, you showed that fourth grade teacher, didn't you? Yeah, I, I wish I could um, contact her. She's really sick right now, so it's not like I can say, hey, look at what I did, but, you know, I just, I think she'd be proud. This is a story about turning a negative into a positive, Nicole. And uh, just because her fourth grade teacher didn't like her paper, it's funny that she came back to that and it became her inspiration for a published book. Nice job, Nicole. Our next author, Bella Altura, I love that name, wrote the story of her life in Golden America. Well, uh, can I tell you the reason I wrote it? Uh, It's a memoir, story of my life, but the reason I wrote it is because... I wanted to write the last three chapters, which are most important to me. And that is that Golden America is on a bad path right now. And I would like to show how wonderful and terrific it used to be, that we have to do everything possible to bring it back to that point. Well, how did it used to be? It used to be a free country that everybody could come to. And it was free because of the Constitution that we have. And it was free because the people are wonderful, mostly. And it was free because of the pilgrims and our forefathers. And it was free for us to move about and have our dreams come true. They really can come true if we work hard. And they really come true. And they have come true for me, and only because of this country, the way it used to be. And so I wanted to write this book to tell people, look, it was such a wonderful country. Why do you want to change it? Why do you want to change anything about it? Like what, Bella? We no longer follow the Constitution. We have sort of a person in the White House, 
who does not know that we the people are in charge and that there is three parts of the government, not a dictatorship, that the government is has balances and that we each of us have to make sure each of us, by voting the proper way, have to make sure that the Constitution is upheld and remains as the law of the land. Tell me about your dream. What was your dream that came true? Very early in life, I think I was nine years old, I was interested. I became interested and fascinated with biology. And that's all I really wanted to study in every which way. So that dream didn't seem to be able to come true in Europe, but it did come true in this country because I was able to have a job, a full-time job, and was able to go to school at night and slowly but surely get a master's degree and a PhD and then get I was lucky enough to meet someone who was interested in the things that I was interested in, and we both worked together and discovered a few things here and there. Where did you grow up, Bella? I grew up in Europe uh, when I was seven years old, that Kristallnacht happened, then we had to go. My mother was able to get my father out of concentration camp, and which was a feat all in itself. Excuse me. Then we went to Belgium, and then when the Germans followed us to Belgium, we went to France. And when they were coming to southern France, we went to northern France. And when northern, when they came to northern France. We walked to Switzerland, and there my parents were put in internment camps separately, and I was put in a foster home. But after the war, we were able to get together again and come to America. What a story you have, Bella. Thank you. Yes, the the story was interesting. And so I was hoping that making people interested in that story, I was hoping that they would read the book and then come to those last three chapters and see see what's happening then, now. Well, it sounds like a good read, Bella. Thank you. Are you telling people about this book? My immediate neighbors, they bought some and they like it. And then I had a little event right in my uh, community, and they that worked out, and I sold some books. Uh, and uh, I put a little ad in in um, a local website. I mean, people know about it from there. Bella, keep working that local angle and share your story. It truly is a story of perseverance. Next up, Deborah Garland wrote One Summer Day. You know what, Deborah? I feel more relaxed just uh, saying the words, One Summer Day. Good, as you should when you read it. Um, The book is about, um, it's a multicultural story about a boy and his family who live in a country with political strife, and they recognize that a civil war is looming, and before the outbreak of war, they need a plan, and they go about making a plan to flee their homeland. They flee their homeland, but what the reader will discover is that home is anywhere where they can live in peace and be together. Where'd you get the idea for this book? Um, Actually, I have a lot of ideas. I have 12 more books copyrighted, not published, so it's something that I do. I write, and as uh, an educator, a former educator, I'm retired now, uh, I taught students how to write. I prepared them how to write for state testing. So writing is something I enjoy, and it's something I did professionally as well. So this is finally your chance to write what you want to write. It is. I have a lot of stories that I have written over the years, but once I retired, I copyrighted them and then pursued having them published. And how was that experience? It's been great. I wasn't knowledgeable of the process, but I have an idea now, 
and it's exciting to see your work come into fruition. Um, my first a batch that I sent out of query letters, I sent out 12. I reached out to 12, and I had a few responses, and page publishing offered the best. Nice. Are you going to publish all of your copyrighted works with Paige? Well, I think there's an approval process that you have to go through. I mean, just because you've written something doesn't mean that somebody else thinks it's worthy. So you always have to submit your writing. And writing is subjective, as you know. So it is my hope to have all of my work published. I will also say that I really, really loved the work of the illustrator, Abla Nabuelo. Uh, it's beautiful. She brought my story to life with her colored illustrations. Oh, that's good to hear. We've gotten a lot of compliments about the uh, illustrator. Yeah, she's she does very striking work for sure. The next part is, you know, it's not just writing the book, it's getting it out there. Yes. I'm going to visit the bookstores nearby and ask them if they're interested in buying my book and then try to work out a, a book signing event and do the same thing in the St. Louis area and with the St. Louis Library as well. All right, so you're feeling pretty confident. Well, you never know until you try. So that's that's my avenue. That's what I intend to do. All right, Deborah. Well, you're on your way with lots of work for page publishing if they decide to publish all 12 of your books. Now, that's determination for you. We are determined to bring you so much more on this page publishing book club, but um, it looks like Rob needs a break. Is that what's going on, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a little break. Come right back, and uh, we're going to catch you on the other side of these words from our sponsor. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. We are, fill in the blank, come on, time's up. It's the Page Publishing Book Club, and we're on a roll here with William Barno picking up the show. He wrote Explorations in Truth, the Human Condition, and Wholeness. Explain that, will you, William? Well, I posed the question at the beginning of the book, is it possible to live a life without illusion? And uh, I think it is possible, but it's very, very difficult. As a quote by Leonard Cohen, he says, um, we're all like Joseph looking for a manger, you know, and we're looking for a purpose and meaning in life. And we're looking for security, and we're looking for a sense of worth. The problem is we die. And therefore, all of our earthly attachments and all of our um, delusions towards those attachments uh, confront us with the fact that, um, like Job, and I have a long uh, commentary in the book of Job, like Job lost everything, we too are going to lose everything. And so, so we have to learn how to suffer, and we have to learn what is the purpose behind our suffering. Uh, it's you know, it's been a long process, and, and as I've grown, the book has grown as well, okay, and it just happens to be completed now. <laughs> Is this your journey? No, this is this is uh, it's a philosophical piece of work. It's you know partially autobiographical. What you know, what work isn't? But um, it's it's a journey into looking at our inner life um, and trying to recognize that silence and solitude and our inner motivations and desires and attitudes and beliefs author our behavior, and that is the essence of what this is the soul. And our work in this life 
is to grow in wisdom and to grow in self-knowledge and to grow in truth and love. And to do that, we have to look inward and nurture the inner life. And so we have to nurture solitude and silence as opposed to uh, being tranquilized by the trivial, as Kierkegaard said. You know, and all these distractions that many of us uh, pursue, including myself, I struggle with distractions as well. So So keep your eye on the ball and and think about why you're here with every action that you make. Well, that's part of it, yes. Um, You know, it's, it's, it's like the ego, you know, is the center of our consciousness, right? It's like, you know, it's the I, it's how I, you know, how we relate to the world, and it should be the center of our consciousness, but it doesn't have to be the center of our uh, entire existence. In fact, the ego is really meant to die to its self-centeredness and to live towards the truth as we recognize truth, as we recognize our self-deceptions. Uh, our ego is meant to revolve around the truths that we come across as we go through life. And the only way to do that is to nurture self-knowledge and to nurture wisdom and to um, place those, you know, uh, at a higher level than, you know, money or status or what people think of us or any other worldly pursuits. I'm curious, what did you do for a living or what do you do for a living? Well, I used to be a chemical dependency counselor for 30 years. So I work with alcoholics and drug addicts. Uh, Now I'm just writing. Okay, William, some food for thought here on the Page Publishing Book Club. Next up, we have Fred Graham Yule, who has fallen in love with the story of Cleopatra. And you will be surprised, so surprised, to find out how it all began and led to his book, Cleopatra's Lost Treasure, Part 1, Discovering the Princess. You know, it was sort of something that uh, happened by sheer chance many years ago, but uh, uh, finally retirement, I had the time to explore it. Anyhow, uh, when my wife's father died, he he, uh, he lived in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, and uh, I went up there, uh, met the brother there, and we, we sort of cleaned out the house and uh, we were down in the basement, which was unfinished, and if you can believe it, sort of rather dark. <laughs> he was an engineer by profession, and he had collected all these magazines through the years, and there were literally piles of them. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, we should get a dump truck, but you can't get one in there. <laughs> At the bottom of a big pile of engineering journals, we came across, I came across this huge steamer trunk, you know, the old-fashioned kind that opens up and their drawers and places for hanging clothes and everything. Well, the whole thing was full of artifacts from Egypt. And I knew it was something pretty weird because they were all wrapped in old newspapers, and the damn newspapers were dated 1842. And I thought, what on earth? And anyway, the first thing I pulled out was this clay lamp that was used for as an oil lamp, you know, in the old, old days, animal oil, and it was used for lighting your way at night. And that was interesting. I thought, God, that's sort of unusual. At any rate, the next thing I opened up was a, a little, very worn gold ring. And that actually, uh, simply because uh, his buddy, a school friend, was on the dig team when he was visiting Egypt. Uh, he, they had just discovered the, one of the tombs at Lux, Luxor, and uh, he had given him the ring that he found in the tomb of the pharaoh. At any rate, it was so badly worn, I knew it had to be uh, genuine, because no forger would ever have a ring that worn. You know how gold wears down in the old days? Because it was pure, it wasn't a mixture to make it harder. It sort of only got more exciting from then on. And I was just about to tell uh, my brother-in-law what it was when he gave a big shout of discovery. And he had discovered another trunk. And in it was an old Daragatai camera. His grandfather obviously was very keen on photography because he had this huge collection, as it turned out, of photographs from from Egypt and Palestine. Incredible quality. And so we sort of looked at each other and said, what on earth? Turns out, you know, he knew he was a cotton miller by, by family. And after the American Civil War, the uh, 
South had no slaves to harvest the cotton. And so there was a huge shortage in the in England because that was the major source of cotton in those days. And so he went to Egypt to see if he could find a new source of cotton for his, his business. <laughs> he, he discovered that uh, there was too much bribery and corruption, and so he gave up on that. And he turned it into a sort of uh, one of those tours people do in those days of the of the Middle East, you know, visiting all the religious sites. And we've got photographs of the old Bethlehem and Nazareth and all that. You know, it's really quite incredible. Anyway, that led me on to a 20-year investigation of the history of Egypt, and then I zeroed in on uh, Cleopatra as being one of the most interesting. So that that's how it all came about. But I did more research, I think, than anyone has done on a novel. It took me over eight years. And uh, I'm into the second book, dealing with her life uh, as a queen. And that turned out to be even more interesting. So uh, I'm, what, 80% into that now? So there's not not a lot to go, but the second book will be out very soon, I hope. Are you a historian? No, no. I'm. I'm if you can believe it, I spent my career with Exxon. <laughs> you must have been blown away when you found all this stuff, because here's a uh, guy you knew for how many years, and, and you didn't know he... I didn't know hardly anything about him, you know. And uh, the only thing I was looking back, I'm very lucky at, you know, uh, uh, I was born and raised in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the education there was very classical by background, you know, far more so than anyone gets today. And, I mean, I started learning Greek when I was seven, Latin when I was eight, and French when I was nine. <laughs> of course, didn't know anything else, you know. <laughs> well, it sure came in handy now, didn't it? Oh, my God. Well, I tell you what, I, I was a lousy student too at school. All I could say is I could. I just imagine my teachers laughing their heads off. I mean, of course, they're long dead, you know, so. But they would be laughing their heads off if they could have seen my struggles trying to relearn Latin, Greek. and. Uh, but, boy, it sure helped in my research because the other thing I discovered I couldn't believe was the original diaries of people like Sir, uh, Julius Caesar were still in existence. Wow. And so I was able to go to the original documents, and uh, some of my translation is at least a lot to be desired, but at least it gave some insights that no other researcher got that I could do. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. I really am enjoying it. <laughs> Are you just doing it for the love? Quite frankly, uh, I, I think it's an incredible story. Uh, the, real, the real Cleopatra, as I call her, it's it's sort of like nothing ever anybody has ever written, and uh, I just say, look, this woman is real, and she was really something else. I don't know. I, I find this fascinating. I mean, this guy ends up doing research he never dreamed of, but he's driven by his passion. That's the most important thing, driven by his passion. Finally, our last author, Jacqueline Kastberg, loved to read so much her parents kept nagging her for years to write a book and finally she put all the elements of fantasy that she loved into a book called the elemental guardians so it's about um this boy who's the last of his clan but he doesn't know about it and he lives in this world where the elements are all balanced out by these four different clans and he is part of the water clan he doesn't know it but he's the last one so he ends up going on this journey to figure out what happened to them and who he is along the way. My favorite part about fantasy was dragons, so I put that in there. The way I had the background of this world work is there are four different animals that balance out the four different elements, and I made him into um, one of the uh, dragons for the water guardian elemental part. And the way it works is they um, don't turn into this um, animal and get in full with their power until they turn around 21. So in the beginning of the book, he has no idea, but in the middle, he happens to become 21, which is when um, he finds out about it. And that's when the fun really starts to happen. Yes. Is this a part of a series? Yes. I actually um, just finished up the second one at the moment, so I'm going through that and fixing up all the little corrections and whatnot before I send it off. But at the moment, it'll probably be around three books. Great. And you just started doing this now? Yes. 
Um, two or three years ago, over the summers in college, I would start writing the first book just for fun. But now I'm actually putting a lot more time into it. Like I said earlier, uh, I just did it as a hobby. And I was pretty amazed that something actually came out of it when uh, Peach Publishing told me that they were going to uh, publish it. Are you just out of college? Yes, I graduated two years ago almost. So what are you doing now? I work at a bank. Actually, my major was business finance and my whole family is in a business background, so that's what I was used to. So I'm actually in the finance baking field as a uh, loan operations manager. This has to be a real treat for you to be able to sit down and kind of let your mind go. Yes, I actually I have a lot of fun doing it, and I'm glad that I was able to mix in something that I love with like you know business, and then do this is like also something that I love. So yeah, I ended up being really lucky in that regard. Are you able to do book signings or promote your book in any way? At the moment, I reached out to my college to see if I could go through um, different venues through the school, which actually worked out pretty well. I also have walked around down here in Charleston to different bookstores. And one of the things that we have down here um, is called the Second Sunday, where they shut down the main street in Charleston and people come out with um, their different goods and whatnot while tourists and just like regulars walk up and down. So I'm going to see if I could do a book signing like that. I have to talk to the city, though, before that happens. And then I also attempted doing business cards for the book, and I've been going around to different shops around here in Charleston to see who will carry them next to their cash registers. It's definitely been interesting trying to figure out different ways of getting it out there. What's your audience? Is it kids or is it everybody? Uh, When I was writing it, I was thinking of writing it for my younger siblings, and they age from uh, 14 to 19. So I was mostly thinking of that range while I was doing it. But my grandfather ended up reading it. He really liked it. So so something for everybody in this, right? Elemental Guardians and more to come in this series. And uh, look for Jacqueline's book signings if you're ever visiting Charleston, South Carolina. Well, that is all the time we have for tonight. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am amazed, I got to tell you, at the number of people who listen to this show and then ask if I can interview them. You know, everybody's written a book, I'm telling you. And uh, I'm not kidding, Rob. I can do it. I can interview anybody I want, but it's a really good idea if it's published by Paige, which is why we have the Paige Publishing Book Club. At any rate, I hope you have found some inspiration here tonight, and if you need a little bit more, come on back next week and the week after that for another edition of the Paige Publishing Book Club right here on 710 WOR. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh, start writing. 